What's up, everybody? It's Kurt the Arborist. You're listening to the Arborist Blueprint Podcast. If you listen to the episodes uh, regularly, I don't know, we're uh, still pretty new, but uh, you may have noticed it's been a little bit since uh, the last recording, but uh, we've had a little influenzas going through the family. So uh, it's been up and down, touch and go, we're going to say. Um, you know, lost the old voice, crackly, still uh, still coughing things up. But anyways, <laughs> enough about me. Um, we're back and glad to be back. Tonight we have a super awesome guest, uh, Jason DiPietro. DiPietro? We'll... Uh, We'll talk to him in a sec here as we let him in. Um, he can explain his last name for us. But he used to be an arborist, a contract climbing arborist, actually in my local area here in Calgary. Uh, slayed tons of trees, old forestry firefighter. He's got a big background. Uh, looks like he was a slasher, logger, all sorts of stuff. And then uh, he's now a tree planter. So we actually met through uh, Atmos Tree and he heard about it and uh, our values really aligned. He's into permaculture, natural ecosystems, all this kind of stuff. He knows tons. <laughs> Uh, kind of beyond the fringes of arboriculture, but still with trees. So he's got a ton or a wealth of knowledge for us. So uh, happy to bring him on. So enjoy the episode. Thanks for joining us. There's Kurt We're right now. Him in. There he is. Hey, Jason. Yeah, I got him. Thanks, buddy. Dude, we're online. You, Hi, got, a, you got a uh, tech guy? <laughs> I got a tech guy. I brought my own tech guy. Cool. It's good because that it's was my business partner, Andrew. Oh, sweet. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and honestly, I, I wouldn't have gotten to this point without him. Thanks, brother. Right on. Some water. Hi, Kurt. Yeah, nice How to you see doing? you. We um, good to see you, man. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, I love the shirt. Fantastic. Nice. Touch. Oh yeah, you can oh, I see should. It, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leaf Ninjas. Hey, nice. I gotta ask you, but before I forget, yes. um, <laughs> the logo is that like the golden ratio? Yes, Fibonacci. Ah. Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequence. sequence. Yeah, dude, that shows that's up awesome. everywhere. Yeah. I, was, uh, uh, go ahead. Please. Oh, was, uh, the, the logo was designed by a former uh, business partner of ours. Uh, one, one, originally, we were five owners. We're down to three. And the one fellow uh, left to pursue a, a career as a Buddhist artist in the Kootenays, bare <laughs> ass in the woods. So <laughs> that uh, he left a legacy uh, at Leaf Ninjas with the logo and a few other art pieces. Oh, cool, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I, was, I didn't notice right away, and then I kind of got home and looked at it. And I'm like, man, that looks like the Fibonacci sequence or golden ratio. I don't know. Is, is there a difference between the I two? Think it's I mean, the same. I'm not sure. Yeah, one's maybe I, like... I like saying Fibonacci. Yeah, it's, me feel. yeah it sounds Italian. Like You're Italian, right? Yeah, exactly. What's the yeah. matter your face? Fibonacci. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> you're biased. <laughs> exactly. The Fibonacci sequence. How do you say your last name? It's Di Pietro. Di Pietro. Okay. Makes sense. It's, uh, um, I, I think, um, you know, I'm no entomologist here, but I think the, uh, the meaning means of stone. It has something to do with the fields not being all that productive. <laughs> oh, like that. Awesome. <laughs> That's great. Well, I know, uh, you, you said you don't do a lot of social media and, uh, that sort of thing, you know, putting your face out there online. So it's not like your normal jam, but I mean, we exactly. connected a lot when we first kind of met. And I really appreciate you coming on. So thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. And honestly, um, yeah, I, I typically turn down offers to to appear on things like this. Uh, I think I'm trying to avoid notoriety. Yeah. Um, that said, um, your podcast is pretty compelling to me. What you're doing uh, in terms of how you you comport yourself in industry, the message you try to get across, the really cool organization and, and – uh, the the really cool idea behind what you're doing with the uh, the Atmos Tree thing, uh, I, I think we, I felt right away that we could have a really interesting conversation about some topics. Yeah, for sure. And it looks you sent me your thing with your background here, which we'll ask you to explain a little bit further in a few seconds. Sure. But yeah, I I really appreciate it. Um, you reaching out to me, it was kind of cool. I asked the universe, I was like, I need some people to kind of come and like help me with Atmos Tree. People that are passionate and fill that kind of gap in that space and I don't know who they are or what I'm doing but I'm one guy and I got this vision and you know it's going great but you know it'd be nice to have some people kind of fit in there because it's supposed to be a big collaborative effort between everyone that joins Atmos Tree and the planters everyone so when you called me up it was like perfect perfect fit so I think an initiative like that Kurt you you remain the man you are and you you uh 
you head towards achieving the goals that you're setting when it comes to an initiative like this and people will see the, a fit for themselves in it. This is the kind of thing where I don't think you'll have to go out of your way very much to recruit help for initiatives like this. Uh, as soon as I, as you describe what you're doing, it hits home for a lot of us people who, especially a lot of us people who were in the, who were, have been, and spent time removing trees and are seeing the, the, like for myself at 50 now, I'm seeing the long-term effects of some of the tree removal work I've done for a long time. So. Yeah, just like physically, you mean? Um, no, yes, physically. I mean, uh, th that said, like, I'm starting to really realize that ecosystems are are, are crucial mm. to us moving forward, and I'm starting to really realize that every single stem out there uh, contributes <clears throat> to the overall benefit that trees have on a on a on a systems whole systems perspective. So I, I'm. I'm I'm realizing that things are getting sensitive and it has to do, uh, uh, it, there's a direct cor correlation between how fast we're removing trees out here and the dire state of things we're finding ourselves in. Yeah, it's definitely changing. I feel like as we get older, maybe that's just how it is for us, but you start to change perspectives and you start looking at things a little bit differently and you know, you're not worried about the day to day, like going to school, going to work and getting that job and getting that mortgage paid off and whatever. It's like, then you start thinking about other things and like, you know, what's my purpose in the world? And then you start realizing, oh shit, maybe we shouldn't be turning everything into agriculture land and just hitting it with uh, synthetic fertilizer and pesticides for years and years on end. And it's like, why are they saying there's only 20 more years of crops <laughs> before it ends? Yeah. Like, and, and what causes that? And then, you know, that obviously led us down the rabbit hole of uh, how it connected with trees and everything. And if anybody doesn't know, Jason was an arborist. Uh, you were a contract climber, I know for sure, in the Calgary area. So you were slaying trees, young and old, for a number of years. Yeah, that and I was it. pruning a lot. I spent a long time caring for legacy trees. I spent a long time um, learning and focusing on wanting to do good by the urban canopy. Um, as, a, as a contractor, obviously, a lot of the work was removals, but that wasn't a focus of mine. I really, like, I did a lot of good pruning, for legacy pruning. I spent nice. a lot of returning years on old plant material and I um, dedicate a lot of my life to learning and um, advancing my sciences and my understanding of what trees needed and how they were and I took it very seriously nice. it wasn't just removing them I actually got out of being an arborist when it became obvious in Calgary that about well over 70 percent of my revenue uh, came from removing trees for development typically for development there was a lot right. like I, I i quit me i quit full-time arborism to get into what i'm doing now which is ecological restoration but i stopped doing full time i started being the climber full-time in 2015 so i've been out of the game for a while and when i got out um things were just advancing to where yeah now we're starting to get access to Things like social media, and uh, I, I mean, when I was in the game, you were buying books and you were working with people, and you were, you know, basically your access to resources and materials was pretty limited compared yeah. to the day. I can just imagine being a young person becoming an arborist today compared to the time I spent time doing it, which was late 90s into 2015. Yeah, that's a weird thing, the whole social media and online presence, because I came from it, you know, I'm pretty new in the industry, like six years now, maybe. And uh, my go-to, because I got into it and I decided I wanted to do it towards the fall. So I couldn't get on with a tree company right away. So I had the whole winter once I decided to kind of get ready. So that involved me hitting YouTube, Instagram, you know, finding the, the who's who out there, yeah, um, cool. cutting trees. And man, it was a wide variety. I found uh, Buck and sure. Billy Ray out west. I don't know if you know who he is. <laughs> no. Oh man, he's so old school. He's an awesome guy. Super nice. Awesome. I've never met him in person. You know, he's all about spreading kindness and... Uh, being oh, a good cool. person and stuff, but, but you know, what I was trying to watch and I was trying to learn and, um, you know, nothing against him because he's an old school dude, but he was, you know, just kind of like one lanyard, old spurs, cutting down these old trees, doing the old school way. And I'm just like, dang, this looks really dangerous. And it, it's dangerous <laughs> enough already. Right. But like, yeah, yeah, totally. It Without was like, old, what if, some of the old school oh, attitudes. It's like, what if he falls? So anyways, <laughs> like, you know, social media and things, it's, as everyone knows, there's there's good and there's bad. I try to share yeah. as much good as I can, but everyone does make mistakes. And and also, funny thing that you mentioned, um, learning from the old books, but like I just took another Arboriculture Canada course. I'm an assistant instructor there, but uh, I still take courses with them or sit in on them and audit them. So like hopefully I can teach them one day. But 
Uh, I just did a tree biology course, and you know everything still comes out of the old school books from like Alex Alex Shigo stuff. Yeah, and it's it's super. It's like ancient. It's like black and white pictures. And man, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of the like. There's a lot to be said about how he looked at things and how he put them across. And for us to for for um, a tree practitioner to at least be able to to um, to connect and see where he was coming from. You know the touch trees, no trees thing, and the the you know the amount of time that he dissected trees and tried to understand what was going on in there. I think just that dedication and that approach, you could you could advance your own, and then mm-hmm. leave or take or give and take with a modern twist the content itself. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that that will like from my perspective, that should stand the test of time. This guy looked at stuff and he he came out with observations and sure, there's yeah. some understandings like you know, that I think evolved beyond where he was at by the end of his looking at things. But I think, yeah. I think old school should be informing new school. For sure. And like a lot of that foundation, I mean, he was so known for, uh, for code it, right. The compartmentalization yeah. of decay in trees, like, mm-hmm. and I mean, Tissue. that probably only needs to be shown once through his experiments. You don't need to do that again. So, Agreed. and he was like the founder of discovering all of that, you know, I'm assuming Great. everyone that yeah. listens uh, knows what code it is. At least I hope. If not, go check it out. Look it up. Look up Alex Shigo. <laughs> yeah, and and get ready to go down a rabbit hole for a while. <laughs> oh <laughs> you my don't god! Know who he is. I think you should read it. And I think what's super interesting is to pick up his just his glossary book and see all the terms. Yeah. And then and then get into the new tree biology, and 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 I think that if you've been working with trees for a while and you haven't read this stuff. That's probably the best way to get introduced to it. Is is um, a lot of what you've been noticing out there probably going to start hitting home in the you know in the scientific laid out method. Here's how what I observed and how I came up with these conclusions. Because yeah. he he just he just went out there with a bandsaw and fucking split trees, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's crazy. It's it's amazing that he had that dedication long term to do all that. I so concur. thanks to him, even though he's uh, not alive anymore, but. You know, they're still selling his books, and his, I think his daughter or his family is still uh, printing some of them yeah, and selling that. them, so that's kind of nice. Ed Gilman yeah, is, I totally. guess, one of the newer guys doing uh, I'm fascinated a lot of stuff. by Gilman's understanding of roots. We, in, our, in the work that we're now involved in uh, with the ecological restoration and the planting trees, like I plant a lot of trees. I'm, I'm kind of hoping I'm getting close to having even the keel. Before being an arborist, I, uh, the way I came into being an arborist is I ran saw up north. I lived in northern BC and in Yukon for a long time. I fought forest fires, but then uh, went into uh, forest fires in the summertime. And in the winter, I would be a slasher, line cutter. I did a lot of um, forestry, uh, civic culture, tree release work. I pretty much only earned my living with a chainsaw from the age 19 on. Oh, uh, like I was a cutter, like a professional cut, travel, have saw, will travel. Did that for a lot of years. Yeah. Um, ended up in Calgary, got trapped by love couldn't leave what the hell am i gonna do in this place <laughs> um i saw a guy on a, in a saddle topping a tree or i think doing some removal some big company thing so i actually started out in calgary by getting hired on by uh the one of the large you know the, the costco company here arbor care and i went on to power line um tr- technical tree removal along power lines and then i got hooked to the technicality of it having come from a, tr- a bucker feller slash slasher career um uh, so i came at being an arborist from being handy at cutting i was all really really handy at cutting i cut for a living i'd be the guy with the the gas and oil cans on his belt so that he wouldn't have to walk anywhere and (laughs) you know get paid by the tanks of gas uh, essentially at the end of the day in the silviculture jobs yeah Uh, i'd come to calgary and see that i could combine that with climbing and learn about trees and their biology and how they responded to Human interaction, that was fascinating. I went down a rabbit hole. I got, I ended up getting hired on by a local um, tree care operator by the name of Jim Oldstad. He had a company called Technical Tree Care. Okay. Uh, he, he's since passed away, but uh, Jim had um, some long-standing contracts to prune the university grounds. And I had the good fortune of being able to return to trees for about five years uh, as an employee of his and and to practice the sciences and to learn and to to work with others on those grounds. Yeah. So I actually got to uh, care for trees on a returning basis for a number of years, which I, I really um, attribute to to the amount of knowledge I was able to garner from what how my interaction with the trees were actually being effective or not effective or leading to causes or not or 
Yeah. So what did you notice? Because obviously if you got a sense, and I mean, it just takes time being in the forest and seeing trees. And as we all know, observing them, and all of a sudden you notice like the nuances and the little imperfections or whatever it might be after you've been around trees for a while. So if you started out in the forest and saw these natural systems, you saw trees from fire, you know, doing forest firefighting and clearing areas for lines. And then civic, civic culture is like planned out kind of forestry. Is that what that civic culture means? Yeah, so typically, uh, if, if you're doing, um, if you're cutting in civil culture, you're, in, in my case, um, what was the actual term? Brushing was the actual term, the position, you'd be a brusher. And after like 10 to 20 years after a plantation, um, you would go in there and release the conifers so that, you know, the deciduous plants that grow faster than the conifers would uh, outcompete them. So they, there's programs, forestry programs where you go into these patches and typically you're cut you're paid by the hectare so the production cutting jobs okay and uh, a lot of times you do with the big brush saws i was a chainsaw hand so i I was in there with smaller faster speed kit saws you know we were tricking our saws out in the 90s to do that kind of work i'd go fall on one job and then the next job would be a high speed slashing job and whatnot (laughs) yeah so so like when you got out of that and moved into urban arboriculture what did you notice about the trees, like how were they different? It was pretty interesting that the internodal spacing and the the just general structure and shape of these trees, because typically they tend to be uh, in ornamental settings and grown by themselves that you were dealing with uh, different branch structures. The way that they react to wind and to environmental conditions is a lot different than um, in the forest in a natural setting where you'd be dealing with with groves and with a shared transfer of energy and of, you know, of uh, sheltering themselves, supporting themselves. Uh, there's a symbiosis there that you see a lot less in, yeah. in urban settings. So yeah. I, that was actually pretty fascinating with how, like, how that tree interacted with its environment, seeing that it wasn't sheltered by other trees and that um, oftentimes they were hacked away, at, hacked at by humans. Oftentimes they were exposed to things like toxicities from sodium and they um, I was pretty fascinated by how they, the, the, the trees were interacting with what I was, you know, what's evidently an unnatural condition for them. Yeah. Uh, the whole lawn, the whole consistent flat lawn with no infiltration, a difference in infiltration points when the, there's rain events or overland flow that these trees were essentially competing with a broadleaf grass that was a, a monoculture around them. It's... Once you start observing these types of differences, I got pretty fascinated by it. So mm-hmm. I got pretty interested at like interacting with the same tree year after year. I became known for that. I became known as the fellow who just wouldn't remove. I, I, a lot of things in common with what you see in nowadays, but back at, when I was in the industry, it was fairly uncommon to turn a job down in my position because I didn't really think the tree needed it or agree with the, the client's perspective. Or, yeah. you know, oftentimes, like me, I was actually pretty guilty of this and that. I, probably has a lot to do with uh, my success now and lack of success then or or intermittent success was that I wasn't really working for you. I was working for the tree. I don't, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, sure, you were paying the bill, but I was just in there to do what I perceived the tree wanted me to do. So. Yeah. No, I hear you. I, I get the lot. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Which is actually how in turn I ended up being in the position that I'm in now, which is planting them because at the end of the day, that's that's really where I bring the best value to the whole system is installing more. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I noticed that a lot in, in arborists. It's like, not that there's a clear division between types of arborists. There's a gray area with, with everything in, in life, I think. But but there is a lot of arborists that, you know, are working for the business side of things. And that's how they learn. And it's totally fine in the business, the production value of it. And then, and then there's arborists who are kind of looking from the perspective of the tree. And they're working for the tree. And probably making less money, <laughs> you know, like me, I still have a hard time, and I feel like I'm I'm definitely trending in that direction too, of like, just people calling from in town and like I want to cut this tree out. It's like okay, uh, is there anything wrong with it? You know, you sort of ask questions like that, like is there anything you need? Can I can I help you prune it? There's other might be some other options. It's yeah. Like, no, no, it's just getting too big, and you're like, it's it's 20 feet That's tall what poplar. They do. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're like, I just cut the top off. It's getting too tall. It's like it's not yeah. bothering you up there, you know, like it's meant to, you know, have natural harmonics of moving and, you know, you try to go through this big, long explanation of why it's so bad. And they're just like, oh, you suddenly shut their brain off and it's like, OK, I'll just call the next guy. Like, thanks. Get out of here. And you're like, oh, and you're like, do I do I even bother doing these jobs? Because I know the trees is going to get removed no matter what. I can't change this guy's mind. 
That's you know, true, but I personally I found that um, if I like what I started doing is I started doing things like by referral only on the card, and I started really having a solid stance, and I started mm. adopting a velvet rope sales technique that you had to qualify to be my client. And then that would sound counterintuitive to somebody who's just getting into business, but honestly, that yeah. was the best thing I ever did is, is listen, uh, you're cool. evidently not the client for me. I don't want to work for you. I'm actually out there looking to work for trees. And that, yeah. I found that that actually spurred my reputation and got me in with – when I became a contract cl climber and I was known for like, no, I don't want this contract. Give it to some other climber guy because ah, that's not really in the – you don't really fit in what I consider a client. Um, I actually surprisingly ended up getting more work and was able to bill a little more. And I was able to, to – um, I found that that wasn't actually impacting my business negatively when I decided to hold a firm stance on it. Yeah, and I know that's – obviously really challenging for newer people you know whether they're going to leave someone's company and start out on your own because you need to get you build that pay foundation for that chipper, right yeah you got to get you got to get money to cover the bottom line you got to get experience uh which takes time you know and get mm. your training up but i think once you hit that level just like going through life when you said you know you get to that point where you start thinking differently about trees and how they are you get to that point i think through business as well where Oh, I agree. You, you get all those basics taken care of, and then you're like, okay, well, what's what's my purpose with my business? Not like your life purpose, but your your business purpose. And you're like, then you have the luxury of being like, and we talk about this with like, I'm a jobber ambassador, so we do all this like business kind of stuff, like these little tips on the side and things. And sure. they always want to bring that up and talk about how it's like, choose your client. Like you can fire your client and whatever. And it's like, yeah, we're not, you don't have to go and just get hired because you're not like the slave of the client to go and do labor. You know how it is. They always go, can you check the eaves troughs? Can you do this? Can Like, oh, I'll fill you up your day. I'll fill up your day rate. No problem. And you're like, no, no, no. I'm a skilled professional. The client needs to qualify to be your client. This is the way we're doing ecological restoration also now. It's kind of along the same vein. And we're, we're finding that you're, you, now you can focus the 80% of your time on the 20% of your clientele that, that is really aligned with your values, that's yeah. really aligned with, with uh, maintaining a long-term relationship, that's really um, – that you don't have to go out of your way to cater to the needs of this person. And this is a doable thing. Yeah. If, if, I think it's important for you to – for a business person, and we're, I've discovered this as I went. My, our business is now rolling along fairly well, and I feel like I – I can give some business advice on certain <laughs> aspects of things, but I think that if you identify your core values and you um, have that guide your business decisions, yeah. I think you can yeah. get a lot closer to not compromising and to having the market um, that's your market present itself yeah. instead of if you take every single call and some of them aren't really aligned with your values and with what you're looking to deliver and offer, you're going to end up um, disparaging that 20% of the clientele that's mm -hmm. right in line with you. The the If you Google velvet rope technique, I'd open my eyes to a, a, to a way to get to a place where I, I feel like rope? I can deliver an ethical delivery. Velvet rope technique, you said? Yeah, velvet rope sales approach. Okay. It's, um, you know, it's it's like uh, if you want to buy a Bugatti, you need to qualify as their client, and it's, right. you know it's not the best example, yeah. but it's no, it's a good way to look at it because you can really focus, especially if you're a startup, you can focus your time and effort. Yeah. Me as a person who was getting closer to what I thought was going to be retirement because I I climbed for a long time, I, my body got beat up. I'm, uh, you know, I, I don't wear it, but I'm I'm nearing 50, and uh, I knew there was going to be an end to climbing around. I, as much as I enjoyed it, the, yeah. you know, hauling a saw around up there, I've I didn't. I wanted to have a good clear out, and but I wanted it to be with trees. Yeah. And then knowing that, I wanted to to make sure that I the time that I spent the, the towards the end of my career that it was it was spent doing things that that I felt validated to do. Like I wasn't just out there removing eighty year old plants for some developer in in which right. was the majority of the work. By the time I got out, was there's an infill going in, and that you know that whether it's a northwest poplar or whatever it was yeah. was in the way and i started feeling like yeah but really honestly i think you're in the way i like i'd leave the tree but yeah. so i mean before we get into like uh you know leaf ninjas and that new uh your new journey here but um as far as this velvet rope sales approach because i want to get back to that that's it's sure. really cool because i'm kind of at this point right where i'm like you know i i was just talking to my wife crystal about this um you know, about how I want to change my business model and what I want to do. And it's a natural evolution, right? Like I built everything up, got the trucks, got the training, got the whatever. It's like, okay, so now I don't need to be up there climbing and killing myself every day. Like now is the time mm -hmm. where I set it up with a proper 
truck and chipper and train these guys. And I look after doing quotes and consults and training and I pick the jobs that I want to do because now I have that luxury, um, you know, which is great. Um, but it's so hard to say no. You know what I mean? Because for one, you want to, we all inherently want to help people, right? You yeah. know, someone's like, oh, thanks for removing my tree. Can you plant a new one, little old lady? And I'm like, you know, like I got kind of like a no dig cutoff. Like I'm not digging. I just decided I don't want to dig. But, I, but I'm like, Interesting. but I don't want to be like, uh, you know, just say no and then have another arborist yeah. come in and show up on the street and everyone's coming over because they hear they're chipper and they want to come, you know, and then it's like I'm giving yeah, business yeah. away. So do you, what do you recommend? Like, do you, do you collaborate so with someone I, I, that can take me, the other way? I was a, I was a for sure dig person. I actually, towards <laughs> the end of my career, I think I mentioned this to you in the past, but towards the end of my climbing arborist career, I wasn't selling uh, tree removal. I was literally the quote would say tree replacement and I would sell you a tree. I wouldn't even ask you. Uh, and I would either lose a job or I'd give you the chance to, to input on where it would go, how it would go, what we would do about replacing it. But I, I got to a point where just removing it because it sapped on your car. I would rather let some other person cater to that market. And then the fact that I was dis, uh, discriminant and that I, I had to be by referral only. And I don't think I'm not going to, I don't, sorry, late. I don't have time. That made him want me to stick around and plant a tree even more. Mm. And here's what I found also uh, at one point, my demand for planting trees. So here, here's what ended up happening is um, this fellow that I worked for a technical tree care, he was basing his, he was kept his truck and chipper and we would dump our chips and stuff at a local native plant tree farm that was just west of town in Springbank. It was operated by a fellow and his wife, Ken and Pam Wright. They, the, the place of the nursery was called Bow Point Nursery and they were mm, catering to yeah. the landscape market, but they were amazing, inspirational native plant growers that like, um, you know, had they really inspired me to go the direction I went in. They they were really focusing on um, source collection of knowing where the genetics came for their plant material. They were growing it out there in fields. They were really going for a plant material that was that was programmed to live in this environment. So I started um, hanging around with them and learning lots and and being inspired to install this plant material that was going to really perform well. Native plants. I'm I that as soon as I met them and. They were kind enough to, to uh, have me around and show me a lot of things and teach me. They kind of, in a way you could say, they kind of took on um, the fact that I, I was so inspired and excited to learn, and they taught me a lot. Oh, wow. Um, I, I would give them a shout out and like it, the the work they did in this area is like it's going to be this is legacy work. There's going to be a lot of their plant material around for a long, long time. But when people found out that I was actually involved in this and I was actually um, I had no problem digging. I wanted to dig. I was the opposite of you. Me, I wanted to plant trees. I already had a karmic debt to pay with all the trees I killed. I was really, really, really good at killing trees. I'm still really good at killing trees. And I, I, I woke up once in the middle of the night wanting to rectify this. I felt like I had a debt to pay. So mm -hmm. I started planting trees and selling trees, just, just my clients, myself. But the word got out. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the arborists like yourself who didn't want to dig, trees yeah we're we're sending a lot of these requests my way and it actually um outgrew me at one point where i had to bring a couple of people in tow to just plant and i um at, at some point i really loved climbing and i was just just climbing arborist so i would i'd show up with my groundy and i'd leave the brush on the ground and go to the next one and i was i was just your assassin man or <laughs> pruner whatever it was yeah. but I, I just wanted to do that jump in my little uh, my little half ton crew cab pickup and put my ropes in there, my saws, uh, go to your, your client's place, climb up there, leave a pile of brush for your crews. I, I did that for a while. So I didn't really want to plant and I had a big demand. So I actually would hand it off or I'd have some buddies who'd plant for me to the point where when I actually transitioned out of arbor culture and I went straight only into planting, um, a lot of arborists started sending their tree planting to me. And that's, and I actually went into uh, ecological restoration planting, so I, I got to a place where I snobbed out and I just want to plant native trees because that's the only thing that'll work. I get, you know, at a certain age, I, I went pretty pretty elitist on on my approach to catering to a specific market, and there was a demand there. And the more I, like I said earlier, the the more elitist and the more velvet rope, the more bouncer I play with my my offering, the more yeah. a certain market opened up, and the more it wanted it, and the more it was. Uh, thirsty for it that's awesome i think yeah so, having a bit of a niche or an edge like that can definitely separate you and maybe it could be tree planting well and i think what i noticed is um it 
yes, I went into a specific type of planting, but when guys like yourself and, you know, when you're uh, every arborist or the majority of your client, your um, audience here probably relate to this, that um, it's a small community. We all know each other. And then we, you know, you get a sense of who's going to be in the tree a lot and who's going to not mind digging holes. Yeah. And you're going to, especially if it's somebody who takes himself seriously, and has a good reputation and is, is um you know is, is caring about their reputation you're probably going to want to send some of that work over or collaborate or have them in tow or whatnot right so, so. how do you re recommend doing something like that so someone like myself who doesn't plant trees i get the odd request once in a while but i don't advertise it obviously i'm interested in with that most tree and we can explain that a little bit later but um how did you sort of transition into leaf ninjas like you said something about you started you know force not forcing but like encouraging replacement on your removals and then maybe you had some people doing it for you said and that became leaf ninjas can you explain all that yeah well leaf ninjas was actually um prior to to me joining it was actually an existing entity okay it was uh there were uh four high school friends got together and started offering like originally it was just yard cleanup service and then they got into um offering food forests um, some of them took a, a PDC, a permaculture design course, and then they, they, was, they identified a market for this. I, I met them through the industry, uh, uh, very interested in food forests. I um, was in the Yukon for a long time. Self-reliance was a topic that interested me while I was an arborist. I, there was a transition period of about two years where I still took a bunch of arborist work, and I collaborated with these friends of mine who had a company called Leaf Ninjas in building gardens for people. I, I think that uh, I built two or three. And then I brought some work to the table where as an arborist, um, I was identifying that there was a demand for um, native plant genetics. And so I was, I was finding ways to like, uh, for example, um, developers who I would remove trees for and had as clients would ask me, hey, do you know anyone who can plant around this mm -hmm. storm pond? And then yep. uh, having been out and about and having tree planter buddies and having been in that industry, I took the odd thing and I found it so incredibly validating. I, I really, uh, there was a lot of demand for something called a live stake, which was, uh, which is uh, like typically um, poplar or a willow cutting that gets inserted into riverbanks. This is a big part of my business now. Yeah. But as somebody who knew how to cut and understood logistics of going out and getting branches and moving them and getting them out of there, that became a pretty easy um, entry point into ecological, ecological restoration for me. And then from there, the demand for um, planting plant communities, shrubs, grass mixes, there I started fielding a larger demand than just your right. ornamental yard land. What I found at a certain point, I think you and a lot of your audience probably relate to this. At a certain point, I found that I didn't want to deal with the homeowner anymore. Me, I hit a spot where if I, if I could just do arboriculture for the corporate people and not have to deal with the, with the homeowner, not have to explain why <laughs> topping the tree was a bad idea, not have to, to try and CSI why this toxicity is evidently sodium from your sidewalk practices. Yeah. Um, I got to a point where... Okay, can I just do arboriculture for these developers, for people who – I don't want to talk to people. I just want to climb trees, man. Leave me alone. Okay, um, yeah. I found myself wanting to transition more and more into catering to these um, municipalities, developers, and the, these um, um, these governmental bodies that I cater to now. And I found that I could um, have a larger impact. I, I was kind of after an impact. Um, yeah. And I think I skipped, sorry, I might have skipped a step there. I, when the Leaf Ninjas and I started overlapping work, um, we offered a lot of the, I guess the delivery is permaculture. We offered a lot of food forest. Uh, edible landscape was how we, we uh, marketed it. Right. Uh, we got really, really handy at understanding. Like I, I was the fellow who'd come over with six types of plums and I uh, and I'd yeah. have um, growers in tow and we really <clears> tried <throat> to, develop a, like a network of like-minded individuals that we could get together like i had we had a fellow who was brewing compost teas actually that i think you nice. uh, we might have this friend in common oh mike, uh, mike at living soils shout out to mike shout out mike um so we started getting <laughs> together like this this um group of in tow practitioners and found that demand the demand for that was insatiable we really we would but 
we got a lot of traction in that realm, and it was actually pretty validating. Hmm. But the time that I spent talking to the human compared to this time that I spent on the plant aspect of designing, right. the wrapping my head around what I found uh, interesting and challenging about permaculture, which was like, how do we keep the water on site and how do we make everything work together and all the all of the elements that I found exciting about that work. I was able to, I, I had a hard time wrapping my head around how do you scale this? How do you offer this and make a living? And how do you not have to always be the guy swinging a shovel? To your earlier point where, you know, if you at a certain age, you're trying to remove yourself from the day to day of this and how can you have a bigger impact? Yeah, um, we naturally transition to catering to municipalities and governing bodies. Yeah, that's cool. I'm kind of in that transition phase right now, too. And uh, I find it really interesting because I still I was just saying today to the guys working with me and we I did a big climbing job or whatever today. So I'm achy sore and I don't normally do big trees climbing, but today was Today was climbing and rigging and all the all the real arborist awesome. stuff, you know, that you see on Instagram. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, it probably wasn't as sexy as most of the stuff you see out there. So we didn't take too much pictures, but <laughs> we got it done. It was good, and nobody died. Good. Um, anyways, I can't remember where I was going with that. But you, uh, uh, you're, you, you, we were talking about transitioning. And, oh and, yeah, uh, transitioning. So, I was telling these guys, um, like the best part of the job for me is the people sometimes. When I go back and I reflect in the day, oh, what was the best part? Oh, I was interacting with these people and I taught oh, cool. somebody something about tree health and whatever. But it's like, what's the worst part of the job? Uh, it's usually the people, <laughs> you know? I leave this job and it's like, you know, did all this work today, just die and everyone's going home. And it's like, couldn't you have cut the stump two inches lower? You're like, yeah. give me a break. Like, come yeah. on, man. Like, Yeah, the people no, is, for me, was my least favorite part. The... <laughs> The interacting with the tree, the going up there and figuring out that puzzle, the big rig and thing, I, that was my favorite part is wrapping my head around understanding advancements in technology and, and you know, swinging yeah. ropes up there, block and tackle. I really loved, enjoyed that. It was, I couldn't eat, eat I couldn't get enough of that. I ate it up. But uh, having to talk to that human at the end of the day and having to, like, <laughs> haggle for quotes when it came to you risking your life up there, like, I know it's uh, hard. It's like, oh, that only took you forty-five minutes. Why does it cost me seven hundred dollars? It's like, well, it my... didn't take me forty-five minutes. I <laughs> I was twenty years. I figured out how to do this. That's why it took forty-five minutes. Yeah. Would you rather be taken way longer and hit your house yeah. and use up all my insurance to make it value for you? But anyways, <laughs> um, yeah, I think the transition phase. Maybe not everyone gets to this kind of point, but I think it's a natural kind of transition where you do realize. You know, maybe it's in your 40s and 50s. But you only have so much time on this planet. You've put in so much time doing tree work, and you're like, is my day and what I can provide and what I've learned really having enough impact by doing day-to-day, -day, bending over, cutting and shoveling and, you know, cutting up logs and moving firewood around for people? It's like that. It may be. And if that makes you happy, that's totally cool. But after a while, you're like, well, you know, we got young guys coming on, and they want to learn. So give them the opportunity. Do that. Maybe I lead concur. them. And think about how you can have a greater impact. So I kind of love your idea of how you expanded and then went into this ecological reforestation. And, uh, you know, I stepped into the Atmos tree thing here, too, to kind of feel like you can do maybe less work or have a greater audience, you know, including things like this podcast to connect mm -hmm. with more people and provide some education and hopefully boost people's level of experience or at least just get them thinking is kind of what I want to do with this podcast. Get people thinking and kind of explore the fringes of a boar culture. Okay, I got all these people on like yourself that are like, you know, arborist slash tree planner, but now moving into tree planning, a lot of permaculture, all these things that still tie into tree care and can definitely reinforce and build a nice good foundation to do good quality tree work, but also give people the opportunity to expand and think of other things that they can do. It's not just I, cutting trees. I credit all my time in the trees and having to fix, you know, diagnosing trees uh, and interacting with clients as to what could be happening with trees. That, man, I, I credit that for the success I'm having in ecological restoration. Mm -hmm. And actually, the approach I take in ecological restoration is kind of unique in the industry because I really come at it from somebody who spent a large majority of his life diagnosing plants and being vested in these plants' health and these and having a relationship with these with this plant material. So when I'm out there trying to wrap my head around designing um, natural ecological communities, when I'm out there trying to wrap my head around, um, you know, having having plant materials survive in super harsh environments and restoring incredibly impacted lands, I'm informing a lot of that by what I learned and um, the, the, kind of, the kind of person I became 
from working with trees and having to consistently be solving tree issues because and wondering I wasn't why. only I'm sorry and wondering why like they come you know like you go to the urban landscape maybe you see a lot more of course diseases and insects exist in the forest too as a natural part of the ecosystem in balance but yeah you come to the to urban landscape and it's monocultures and people don't want There's diseases some really there. Really interesting challenges uh, in urban in urban landscape and urban forestry. Some really like if 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 you're you know which I I could see you might be a little bit too. I got into a, a nerd about it. Like if you didn't want to talk trees at a party, I was spouting in the back <laughs> there. It's uh, and in the urban canopy, man, there's a lot of you, you'll be you'll be your whole life being challenged and interested in learning stuff. So I I think that taking that into what is now okay, I I I have an impacted site here. Um, we want to restore functioning ecology. Um, what what do you got? What's what, what? How do you see us achieving success here? I feel like I'm able to arrive at a place now of of a through a good consultative process, and a lot of that is informed by the time I spent uh, in arboriculture. So, I, and I think that if you wanted to transition into it, even expanding your business, or you're an arborist and now you want to cater to the, the tree planting. If you've been an arborist caring for tree health in their maturity for the last five, ten, six years, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to wrapping your head around best placement, best sh selection of plants, you're, you're actually probably going to be pretty well informed. You just spent ten years removing that Manitoba maple, Manitoba maple that's performing this way in a site like that. You got a good idea that if you plant it here, it might might react this way. You might end up having it growing it too far over the garage or whatever like having been around mature plants actually, actually i think is pretty crucial to making really good informed planting decisions yeah that's cool and that's why i really aligned with you when we first chatted i think we have a lot of the same kind of visions and wants and passion mostly towards this because i obviously don't have the knowledge in uh in your landscape you know pine will use that um, but maybe I should just back up real quick and just tell everybody if anyone doesn't know what atmos tree is and kind of how we got connected for a little self plug here, but Atmos Tree is a organization that I started for arborists. Uh, it's a two to one tree, rep like two to one offsite tree replacement program. I call it, I say offsite because you always assume it's on site. But so when we go and cut a tree, um, you know those trees often aren't getting replaced unless you're Jason and you, you know, enforce having to replant a tree on your property. But it doesn't always work out for people. And all these municipalities have you can't do that. You know, you got to have deposits and you got to whatever. You got to plant so many trees, but it's back on your yard, and they didn't want the tree in the first place. There's so many challenges and problems I see with that and trying to manage it. Um, I thought one night, same as you, I I woke up middle of the night. Well, I don't think I fell asleep, but and this idea just downloaded like neo in the matrix when he got plugged in the back of his neck there i was like whoa oh my god why don't i start something like this i came up with the name like everything all in one night the whole business plan but basically um arborists can join atmos tree and then when they remove a tree for a client uh we charge them a small fee like 25 dollars in canada 20 dollars in the u.s and uh that money goes towards uh the plant or the, the planting of two trees off-site somewhere so I'm always looking for places Brilliant. and partners to collaborate with like yourself um, to plant these trees and of course I can't get out there and plant them myself I don't have that expertise but we take this money we pool it together so we have buying power and uh, and jump on these plantations and of course I don't want to plant a monoculture in the middle of a field because that doesn't make sense to me I have a background in permaculture just like you and uh, appreciate the biodiversity and the the ultimate benefit to planting trees it's not just about planting trees it's about planting trees among the other biodiversity tying everything together and understanding the whole system and how it contributes back to the world not just you know a lodgepole pine in the middle of the farmer's field in a row kind of thing so um anyways awesome it's it's free to join atmos tree if anyone's listening and they want to learn more just go to atmos tree.org um but jason is one of the people uh and leaf ninjas is one of the groups that we're going to be planting with some here right away um, and I guess the main thing that you guys do is you said ecological re restoration. You bet. Right. So can you explain like to people what that is? Like what makes leaf ninjas different? Like, why is it awesome that Atmos tree is partnering with you guys versus just throwing money at, you know, some planting organization online? Um, that's a good question. And I think, I think <laughs> that at some point I'm hoping that you get to a scale where, you know, you, you also, um, 
you also collaborate with some of the people who are just strictly just planting trees out there and, and working on the you know canopy expansion um, vision that we all have, right? But Leaf Ninjas, um, what we do is we are strictly a native plant installation company. We don't plant ornamental trees. We, we don't. Uh, we, you, you won't have us lay sod. We're not landscapers. We don't cater to um, any of the um, conventional landscaping tree planting. We won't come out there with a, 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 a named cultivar. Where this is this isn't the industry we cater to. We cater to specifically projects that involve installing native plants. Uh, so typically we'll. I mean, and these there's all types of projects that we we um, are involved with and that we participate in. One aspect of this is also bioengineering. So we'll work a lot in repair repairing areas is where so that's uh, the areas along st uh, streams, rivers, mm -hmm. lakes, um, creeks. We find ourselves doing a lot of work on repairing areas. They're a crucial habitat, and they're sensitive habitats that are being impacted quite a bit in, their, uh, in terms of restoring function to some of the habitats that were impacted by development, industry, um, events, flooding. Flooding is a big, was a big catalyst to getting us into this business. We right. did a lot of work on repairing riverbanks and such. Um, Leaf Ninjas um, specializes in not only installing some of these this plant material, and we you know, we'll get work through bidding process, request for proposals. We'll get work um, through oftentimes through um, programs, grants, that sort of thing. Um, but typically we'll be, when we install a project, it'll be to the tune of several thousand to tens of thousands of stems. It'll be oftentimes the prescribed by either Ecologist. It's hard to put it in a box because we, we cater to a lot of different sectors in the industry, but right. the, the basic, how it breaks down and the constant through all the projects is that it's native plants. Um, there's It's typically in um, Western Canada. We do a lot of installations in Alberta, but we're in the north of Alberta. We're in the south. We're around municipalities, Calgary, Edmonton. We'll be in the, along the riverbanks. We do a lot of... Um, genetics procurement so we'll have crews out there collecting seeds and cuttings to be either grown out or uh, installed directly into into um, restoration sites we um, we don't just install at leaf ninjas does a lot of um, maintenance and monitoring so we'll be typically um, working on these projects and on these sites for three to five years typically mm -hmm. some of them are can run into longer legacy we support some first nations people with um on their lands and some of some of those projects we foresee running into the 10 15 year period we're not going anywhere this we're building this thing to to be um self-sustaining legacy we're uh, currently at about currently we're at about uh, 25 people currently but we will peak to around 40 in the middle of summer potentially depending on projects and where we are cool we um also see the projects through maintenance phase a lot of times these impacted sites are, are susceptible and vulnerable to invasive weeds there's a lot of issues with plant establishment a lot of times the exposure is super hostile a lot of times the conditions um it, it's really challenging establishing plant material there so we developed uh self-propelled uh, irrigation systems, solar-powered irrigation systems, amongst other solutions. We have, like, in tow, we have um, some people who help create solutions for us, like, for example, there's a company called Ecologic Horticulture. Shout out to Nathan and his crew. They're out there making products like native plant turf that you could lay out like sod, but it's it's a mix of native grasses and other forbs in there. It's just a brilliant product. Cool. There's... Um, a, Another company, uh, Preta Pellets, shout out to Lee and those guys. They they'll develop uh, soil amendments for extremely harsh environments where we can where we can uh, deploy things like a, a pellet that'll expand into a slow release um, beneficial amendment to some of these sites with uh, organic matter and some humates or whatnot for the specific sites. Are so you we, we we've got please. 
Oh, I was just going to say, are you finding like with all this kind of stuff, doing things a little bit more organically and building in diversity and, you know, that's going in that direction. Are you finding survivability being uh, yes. better? And Yeah, our focus is, um, is one of our core values is Kaizen is improving cons- constantly and survivability is a focus for us. Um, we don't walk away. We again, uh, that velvet rope. We, we maintain very. I very much maintain the. Um, if you're proposing, if the drawing and the proposal are, off, and this happens, um, <laughs> that that I don't think it'll survive. I'll walk away. We don't. We we're. There's a lot of demand for this work. There's a lot of demand for this work. There's honestly, you you won't keep up. You won't scale to to meet the demand. This is um, the it, restoring ecology is is. Uh, is basically being a nurse in a pandemic. You're, we're we're at a dire state with with the amount of damage out there. We're in a dire state. The the your typical watershed, if you break it down in the sections and have a look at it, is is in dire straits. We're there. The the pressure on the ecology right now in Western Canada is uh, I, it's at a brink. It, it really is. It, yeah. Th- there, it needs to be. Uh, from my perspective, and I, it, it needs to be focused on, and the approaches to solutions need to be scalable. We we got to start deploying um, solutions at scale, and so we're we're looking at we look at this. We we're conscious of this is beyond. We are not just out here doing business. It's the people who work with us. We're this is a a work of passion for us. We really 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 want to leave uh, s- legacy sites. We're not out there planting a tree and then selling another tree to plant. We're out there right. getting a, a, a community of plants in the ground and, and doing whatever it's going to take to have them survive. Do you think so, it's... yeah, survivability is actually the the lead the driver for for coming up with these solutions? Right. Yeah. Obviously, it would make sense because like that's what you want in the end. So if it's not surviving, it's like, well, why? Let's start asking the question of why. You know, and when we hiding... came in um, to this industry, it's, I, I'm not kidding. It was it was. Uh, accepted and actually uh, pats on the back for 10% survivability. We found this unacceptable. We, yeah. we like, it's unacceptable. Um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the sites that we ended up getting at first when we got into this were redos. It's still, there's still a lot of redos out there in the industry and redos are actually important in learning, you know, learn, learning lessons from. We, we've spent a lot of our time wrapping our heads around, okay, how, how, what, what do we learn? How can we get better? What, what's the next one going to look like? So we're at a place now when we're deploying plant material, we, we've got, we've got a lot of confidence. If you're talking to me about restoring a site or getting plants in the ground and then being there in 30 or 40 years, we, we're, we're actually talking to you with a fair amount of confidence. We've got solutions. We've got an understanding of the process to get to a place where that stuff is going to work well. What were some of the big things that you guys noticed um, during those redos and analyzing them that wasn't being done that really, you do differently? It's like a really what, good question. Um, establishment phase irrigation, watering, establishment phase uh, conditions. So understanding that uh, transplant, uh, from transplant to being established into the, the native soil, or whatever media that you just brought your plant material into, yeah. that establishment period is crucial, and there was uh, oftentimes, still today, isn't enough focus on the required conditions for a plant to establish well. And then you'll, I mean, in the arborist world, you'd be more familiar with this, um, having dealt with cal- installing caliper trees and wrapping your head around the amount of time per inch of caliper it's going to take for that plant to get established. Um, but beyond that, we got to wanting to understand soil conditions, biology, structure, chemistry. We got to really want to understand during the establishment period what was going on in terms of climatic demands on this plant. Um, You know, if it was having to support a a wrong ratio of shoots to roots or a a large canopy to unestablished roots in in the system, we started wrapping our heads around what the demands were on that plant and how to mitigate the challenges. So we found that a younger plant or a smaller format plant, excuse me, not necessarily younger, a smaller format plant tend to establish faster, tend to uh, have access to natural resources. We got to a place where understanding that plants grown in root pruned containers could establish faster, again, with certain considerations. But if you had plants that had a better de- root pruned container, so containers they, they that grow out and air prune off. 
correct and then yeah. they would cauterize and back branch and form a better more denser root system that as per ed ed gilman's uh what we understand from some of his studies and his research that we were looking for for uh root points that could establish out and down as opposed to circling and as, yeah. as in the uh, conventional containers transplant shock is actually what we noticed to be the biggest driver of failures the 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 biggest contributor to not having success at the end of all the efforts and typically people who install these types of projects they care they want it to work but there's some there for and there still is for a long time there was a disconnect between the designers and the people wanting an end result and then the in implementers now just i'm seeing this gap being bridged where uh, implementers are involved more in the consultation process in the early planning phase but what i found was that people weren't putting enough uh, focus on what was needed during the establishment period. So soil conditions, a huge thing. You would go in there, a developer would go and run his D8s and grade it all out and say, okay, plant me a park <laughs> or plant me a natural area. And then there'd be issues with infiltration and be issues with soil compaction and uh, chemistry and biology. And there's no like, what we're starting to understand is the reason things work well in forests is that it's not just trees and soil. Is there's trees, soil, biology, moisture regime. There's there's uh, a lot of shade and a lot of shelter from wind, so that the climatic demand on transport evaporation were mitigated. And they weren't the same as a plant that was just brought out and dropped in the middle of a yard or in the middle of a of a you know a new development that needed to be re re naturalized. Right. So a lot of this relates to. Like you said, as arborists, we all know getting a tree from the nursery, whether we do it or not as part of our business, people always ask us and they're like, well, where should I get my tree? Where should I, you know, should I go to Canadian Tire and buy the, the, the cheap columnar aspen or should I go to Bow Point Nursery or somewhere that's, you know, got the seed from the local environment and you pay twice as much. But like, so do you want to so maybe dig in into a... that a little bit? Like how, yeah. how trees are different from the nursery from a quality versus poor quality type situation. So actually, I, as I, when I was I, mentioning some, what I consider to be um, contributing factors to some of your plants failing and what we, the whole, what led to redos, yeah, source, sourcing, plant sourcing was a big, big factor. Um, there, you know, you, there's still is today, very much this is a problem in my industry is plant supply. So you'll, you'll have um, someone who wants the end goal, a stakeholder, a municipality, a developer, or someone who's um, in the industry extracting resources and having to, to put back um, some of their sites. What we're finding is that the scale of some of these desires didn't match what was available on the market in terms of production. Uh, Bow Point, I was a small company. There's some right. companies out there who cater to producing uh, native plants, uh, plant material at scale. Grumpies in uh, Pitcher Creek, shout out to them. They, they, they're trying to keep up to the Alberta demand in terms of scale, but mm -hmm. typically there's also some uh, some large, I mean, there's a lot, I could sit here and rattle off plant producers, but what I think is important that if you're going to be planting plant material, what I found to be important is understanding the provenance of the genetics, where where did you get these, why, why are you growing this specific genetics, and then making a relationship, relationship with the grower. So depending on... Uh, the, the size of plant material you install, what I found was very important was to have the growers who produce have an understanding of my demand, have an understanding of the, the demand that we field yearly and then where we think the industry is going to go so that they can get ahead of producing plant material. This is the kind of tricky. Somebody wants you to remove a tree, you pull a saw out of the truck, you fire it up and you go remove the tree. Somebody wants a specific amount of plants or specific type of plant, that process has been begun 10, 5, 10 years, depending on how, what size of plants you want. Yeah. Um, somebody would have had to have thought about plant growing this out in a, you know, in a, in a, there's good growing and bad growing, just like barter is somebody yeah. who's just throwing out Maydays out there or Schubert's because they, you know, they, they know they get bought and they're out there um, pru nursery pruning it. You're not necessarily get the best plant material out of the deal. So I, I would, to your point, I would definitely suggest if, if, Installing plant material and having um, a relationship with the legacy that of what that means is important to you. Having a relationship with the grower is key, is number one. Or, or the supplier, if you're you know no if one, you're an arborist yeah. who's like, dude, I just I just buy <clears throat> ten gallon plants and put them in to replace trees. Right. If you know if that's how you want to get into installing trees, I think it's important for you to know that the nursery guy at the 
garden center? Who supplies you that plant material? And have a sense of where it's from. Did it? How was it overwintered? Uh, is it hard enough? Did it just come out of a greenhouse? What are we? What are you bringing this tree? And is it suitable for the site? Uh, right. Just because the client likes the shape of an elm, doesn't necessarily mean that elm's going to perform well in that site. <laughs> and I think that it's important to have an understanding of uh, of the site and its holding capacity. What you know, what what that site is suited for. I think there's a lot of factors in getting to a successful installation. I'm sitting here throwing yeah. a few points, but I think you're going to be a long time wrapping your head around how to properly deliver this. <laughs> yeah, I have a few ideas of kind of things that I generally explain to people, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong anywhere too, because uh, you're you're uh, really well versed at this. But I tell people like when I do health consultations, like if they get a, an inexpensive tree from like a department store type setup. You know, the tree could even be bigger and it may not grow as well as something that was smaller, like you had mentioned before. Kind of like when you're gardening and you plant seeds, you know, weeks later after you had a, a something started indoors, but then it has to go outside, harden off, reestablish. Yeah. It's got circling roots from its little pot and it's got to overcome all of those things that it struggles. And then the one that you planted from seed just can like take off because it's naturally, uh, you know, taking a foot in the ground and everything. So I. I tell people too, like those seeds themselves, usually when you go to a quality place that does native things. And, you know, unfortunately, like you had mentioned before too, they are kind of like boutique places because to have quality, it's usually done at smaller scale, but yeah, um, scale so is an we, issue. Yeah. So hopefully we can scale over time with this kind of thing. But for now, we're, you know, getting that foundation before we can scale. But, anyways, getting back to, the quality, like a quality place, you do have to look for somewhere kind of more local to you, somewhere that has gone out and probably Agreed. sourced seeds from a native species in your region, like in your area, and that might be within less than 100 kilometers. And, and I then understand grown there's a desire root. also for ornamental species, and I, I totally get that. But again, same in the ornamental world, there's there's people doing really good work out there, and there's some yeah. really well suited and adaptable trees, and there's some like around Calgary. I, um, I'm going to shout out another. Wheatland Growers is a phenomenal at scale grower who could supply all types of size of trees, and they're consistently wrapping their heads around uh, provenance for hardy plants and for, for they're wrapping their heads around can it overwinter well and you're not getting something that just got imported and is susceptible to all all of the local intemporaries, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and it makes sense that the more inexpensive trees are gonna be coming from somewhere where, you know, Maybe they're not all clones or anything. They could just be seeds, but they're going to be grown in a controlled environment, somewhere where they can grow really fast. And maybe mm -hmm. they use synthetics or something like that to help them grow and look nicer because they uh, have nicer color now to them. And then they get shipped out all in at mass, you know, delivered to all the nurseries and whatever. And those people are often seasonal workers, and they don't mm -hmm. know. And everyone tops up the pot that it came in, so now the tree's too deep. Roots are yeah. starting to girdle, and then you go home and you just look where the dirt line is and you shove it in the ground and you have one soil from your tree, which here it's hilarious because they're like really sandy and they were sticking yeah. in essentially a clay pot and sand and clay make like cement. So and it's just like from, there's so many things like to overcome. And there's some interesting things. If you're buying from sources like this, like you're, you're at the hardware store or any of those, uh, you know, rolling trees through type um, urban s garden centers, um, I, I attended a fascinating workshop by Ed Gilman when he came to one of the tree conferences years ago where he was explaining that um, the liner pot container, is can, the shape of that in the root ball can still be found. And that like the longer you hold a plant in this container, the more irreversible the, the shape of the root ball can be. Yeah, and then you hard, show me woody. pictures that you take a pressure washer to them and you can see the last yeah. five gallon upsize. You can see the liner pot. You can um, yeah. th this you're not purchasing something that's going to give you the highest chances of reaching a successful outcome when it comes to installing yeah. a living thing into a um, at mercy environment. Right. Yeah, I. I really want to have on, uh, I think his name is Ron Zilmer from Legacy Trees in the States. I'd kind of come across him through someone else. And then anyways, they're growing everything in like shallower pots, awesome. these air pots, right? Yeah, Probably awesome. the same thing you're talking about. So the, the totally. roots can all grow out. And then, of course, they yeah. come out the holes and then they air prune off. But you know they're spread out in the right direction. So you when bet. you put it in the ground, it's you're going almost like wider as opposed to deeper and all these different things. But... It solves that problem of the girdling. 
And establishment with those is typically what we're finding is at least twice as fast, sometimes three times as fast. Um, uh, sometimes uh, with a, a five-gallon plant, ten days later, it's hard to pull out. Like the establishment is incredibly wow. sped up. The the vigor of these plants, in terms of also producing them in the in the containers, they seem to be faster to produce. There's a lot of benefit with air pruning plant material, especially trees. Yeah, do you know where? Do you know anywhere that does uh, those pots around here? Just curious. Yeah, I know that Wheatland Trees grows in air pruned plant containers. I know that uh, Ecologic Hort they they produce plants in air pruned containers. This is just two that I know of, but this is becoming a yeah. uh, more widely accepted way to produce trees. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm me personally like uh, I I keep a permaculture yard and I, I don't every single thing I propagate I'm a bit of a nerd I've got a room dedicated to propagating plants yeah. trees shrubs seed, whatever seed I have I try <laughs> to pop it's fun um, I do everything in, in um, I swear by air pruned containers the the now that we're several years into installing all because we're the scale I'm at like we, we do hundreds of thousands of stems a year I install a lot of plant material um, my preference if I had a choice to buy an air pruned container or not is always going to be air pruned. My producers are becoming aware of this and they're gearing up and trying. This is a, a bit of the, this is kind of a new convention. And if you're a producer, you're typically in indebted into your conventional, you spent a lot of money on these round pots that you've had and you're wanting to, you know, it's, it's, it could be, um, well, it's easy. It's easy. And, and it's, people just it's, don't understand. They just don't even know. Cause like they're yeah. at the beginning of the line. They don't like we see the end of the line as arborists. So then they start back paddling and being like, "Where is this coming from?" I was at an, our local nursery this morning, and we were doing some little social media um, little clips, you know, to throw on Instagram and TikTok and stuff for them, and in collaboration and just talking about tree planting. And I'm trying to burst out like some information as quickly as I can. And we show a little column or aspen, and I dig down and like even the owner of the the nursery, you know, isn't really familiar with the uh, girdling roots and the depth of the tree underground and I just opened it up two inches, almost three inches before it got to the roots, which I think were like secondary roots growing above the other ones. And they were already woody and pressed right against the trunk. And it was a pretty young tree. And I'm just like, holy crap, because like their stuff's actually like decent quality compared to some other places that we've gotten trees from. And I'm just like, you know, thank God they're resilient. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that your understanding of the, the situation is going to go a long way. So buying plant material is the first challenge, finding good plants, you know, and having a relationship with where they're from, especially if you're going to be consistent at planting, and especially if you're going to have a relationship with the outcome. This is where I don't typically walk away from projects until a few years down the road, and I, I'm very much left holding the bag. Did it work? Did it not work? So we, we really had to find solutions and get to a place where we could and do this at scale. You know, we planting, uh, amending the one site, making sure this little tree is going to be okay with stakes is one thing. But how how do we, you know, how do we do this for hundreds of thousands of stems out there? How do we um, yeah. uh, uh, provide assurances? I think it's important that to have some ethics when it comes to that sort of work because this is gonna, this should in theory outlive you if you're planting trees. The the, the yeah the, the you know the the purpose is to to leave something behind that's that's beyond yourself, right? From yeah. my perspective. And so how you want to we, try and understand as much of it as possible. And everyone needs to understand it, like along the way, like how do we scale this and how do we have, you know, the people that are, you know, getting the seeds from those native areas, understanding, you know, and passing that knowledge on to the next person as the tree grows, whether it's, you know, that now it's like the nursery that's going to be selling the trees because they're just a the middleman just selling them. So they don't really need to know about what's going on over there. They're just, they just accept it and sell it and tell you about the species that's for the area. And then you know, you plant it yourself or some other tree planter does it, but then they, or developer, you know, and then they walk away because it's like, well, the tree's not going to die for a few years. So, and then the arborist shows up and is like shaking his head, you know, there's nothing you can do to help now. Like yeah. it's where, where could it have been stopped, you know, in the past and how do we fix this chain of transfer of trees and plants to not have this problem? I think when it comes to the nursery, what what we're starting to see, I mean, I'm in, I'm in a bit of a different world than the ornamental world, and we deal sp uh, specifically with st certain types of growers, you know, native plant growers. But um, what I think is happening a lot is that fellows like yourself and f these types of platforms, the available information out there, what that's doing is it's creating a more informed consumer. It's creating somebody who's a little more discerning in terms of buying plants. Um, I'm 
I, I'm a nursery man's nightmare. I walk through your tree lot looking for trees, and I'm culling, and I, oh, oh this sucks. And why did you do that? And is that a mite? And oh, oh, I'm a nightmare. You know, they hate seeing yeah. me coming around. Yeah. Uh, but that said, we, well, I'm probably, I, I don't know of anyone who buys more plant material than us. I, we, I actually don't know of anyone who purchases more plant material than us. We buy hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of plants every single year. Um, and I have to be discerning. This is, this is my the success of my business is very much reliant upon is it a good plant to begin with because i have all these other challenges on the other end i got all this this poor soil lack of water hostile exposure i got all these impacted site conditions um i the last thing i need is to be set up with already uh, a failing proposal you know proposition with poor genetics or poorly produced plant material so i'm pretty discerning and i think that you know, you as an arborist, if you, you start installing plant material and you're out there in people's yards, and this clientele as an arborist, a lot of you will know, it's a returning clientele, it's a word of mouth clientele, and, and it won't take long for people to say, he planted trees for me, they died, I never saw the guy again. This is So what that's doing is it's creating an informed clientele, and it's kind of forcing the nurseries to source better and to maintain better and to educate a little better when they're selling you a plant. I, yeah. That's what I think I'm noticing. Yeah, so I can see what you said then about having that relationship. So say if you're an arborist and you're listening out here and you want to start planting trees for customers, you obviously don't want them dying either. And the whole warranty thing is such a risky business out there. People are returning trees, and I don't even know if people make money off them, but you'd have to find a good nursery that understands these things with you, and you can build that relationship and understanding of what, what it is that you want and what you're going to install, and then understanding how to plant it properly, and then you're probably going to have a lot more success. The tree's going to grow better, and then... Your word, your and I, you know, if, if this is something that really interests you, I would always recommend that you learn about, um, you know, the tree's relationship with mycelium, mycorrhiza. The, with, I, I suggest that um, just planting a tree, yes, it's important to learn the steps and it's important to understand what's going to lead you to a successful outcome. But I think I would absolutely suggest that uh, some time spent delving into the relationship between the, the plant the tree and the biology in the soil so yeah. that um, you can wrap your head around providing the best establishment conditions for that plant. The establishment period is the most crucial once. Typically, as we know, trees can be pretty resilient, can be pretty versatile in terms of what they, they, how they overcome specific challenges and specific adversities. Mm -hmm. I think that once they're well established, Usually they can, it can run its course, and there's very few course corrections. You know, the the right structural pruning maybe, and the the right um, watering regime to help during the vegetative period, which is fairly short during the season. So also understanding at which point during the growth season the trees goes through which processes is going to be really important for you to advise your client best in terms of when to water, when to stop watering, how much water. You know, wrapping your head around. Um, site conditions in terms of pour water into a hole does it sit there well that's gonna want to inform how you amend the site and right which plant you put in the site i think i think it goes a lot further than did you just buy the right plant so yeah there's... i would always suggest that if you're not spending a certain amount of hours a week learning about the whole system the, mm -hmm. the you know all the elements involved in what's going to lead that plant to be successful there i say plant but I, obviously we're talking about trees mostly but I think this applies to any context, whether it's your house plant or the tree in the backyard. I think understanding its relationship with its environment is going to be crucial. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. I uh, I love learning about mycorrhizae and the fungi and the under underworld kind of network there and how trees interact with other microbiology bacteria, all the way up to earthworms and beetles, whatever it is. Um, so how does that play into what you'd recommend? You know, maybe urban trees or uh you know when you're doing these plantations and you come to a site and it's been uh it's it's terrible as it is it's dirt essentially or yeah. maybe they've they've you know quote tilled it but they've you know run uh machines yeah. over it to till it all up or remove stuff that kind of thing so you know you're starting basically from scratch there's no network there yeah. there's a lack of biodiversity how how do you amend that and how long does it take and then how long is this establishment time like That's a great question it's, this is a great question. This is something that, that we spend a lot of time thinking about. There's, there's different understandings. Here's mine on this. Um, 
the understanding I have is in a perfectly functioning uh, system in the forest, these trees, whether it be a deciduous system, conifer system, whether it be prairies, aspen parkland, na name it. These trees are out there forming. Uh, I'm going to say trees, but this will apply to the whole gamut, all the layers, the, the shrub, the understory, the, uh, the ground cover, everything out there. These plants are going to form very specific associations with very specific microorganisms. So it, it could be um, f fungal dominant or bacteria dominant, depending on the system, depending on the type of plants that are there. But my, what I'm starting to understand, and that some of the, a lot of the papers that are coming across are indicating that um, depending on the system's function and, and the need of the particular plant, the exudates that it puts out, the plant man can turn off a specific exudate, turn yeah. on another specific exudate to form very specific <clears throat> relationship with a very specific individual microbe, whether it be fungus or, or bacteria, uh, to serve the function of chelating specific elements in the soil mm -hmm. and making those available. So. I'm not going to break down the whole soil food web, and I suggest that if you're interested in the spot topic, this is something you look at. Elaine Ingham's work, uh, Nicole Masters out of New Zealand especially, that those works inform some of the understanding that we're working from. Yeah. But what here's the understanding is that a community of plants will put out exudates, uh, gases, sugars, that sort of thing. That's going to attract certain biology, and then they're going to interact. There's going to be a symbiotic relationship between the plant putting things out and um, organisms in the soil making available certain resources, whether it be nutrients, trace elements, minerals, that sort of thing. Yeah. My, it, it, to give you an example of how we approach this, we install a lot of a certain type of willow. This is a plant that spreads rhizomatously through the ground. It does an amazing job at uh, retaining soils and preventing erosion. It's a great colonizer of riparian sites, and we work with this willow a lot. Uh, so what we started doing is we we produce we we actually we uh, leaf ninjas we maintain a plantation of this specific willow so that we can provide propagules for some of our projects. In that plantation, there's uh, this is just an example of how we'll go about harvesting some of these uh, microorganisms. Is we'll collect all the duff and we'll build a big compost pile. We'll get that cooking and then we'll brew what we're calling liquid biological amendment, an LBA, a compost tea. Uh, we'll also pretend, potentially make extracts. And then the idea is to reapply this biology that's specifically associated with this plant. Mm -hmm. um, the, with the decomposing and the growing in this plant, we'll, we'll take some root zone material too into this um, compost pile. And then the, the, the plan, the thought is that when we, we actually, when we transplant, we water in with this solution. Okay. To trans, we you, to treat it as a transplant solution. We also uh, make a transplant solution out of more general ingredients, some uh, general compost, vermicompost, that sort of thing. But j just to, to point out how we'd like to look at it is I think it's important to understand that there's the, the microorganisms in the conifer forest and deep moss are going to be very different individuals than the one that's interacting with your aspen over here in the parkland. Um, you can, what's typically done when you're inoculating sites right now is it's typically done a shotgun approach. Okay, mm -hmm. well, let's get this little packet of mycorrhiza and let's get this worm compost tea. And let's get all of these bugs and then throw them on there. And then the idea is that the plant will associate with some of them and that it'll work. We're starting to understand that it's a little more specific than this. Right. Um, there's still, it still works and it's hard from my understanding to quantify. I'm not a soil scientist. I'm, I'm just someone who... Um, I'm an implementer who tries to reach solutions, and I know that there's these understandings out there, so I rely heavily on papers from people like Ed Gilliman, Nicole Masters, and people who are out there looking at these processes. Um, but I think that, to your point, what I'm starting to see is that you can buy mycorrhiza that I think some brands we feel are pretty effective. I was going to ask you about that. Mike's, like, yeah, like Mike's, for example, or this root rescue or um, different things. Like, what's your opinion on that? So what I'm going to do is not name any specific brand. What I'm going to say here, just to not throw any specific company under the bus or whatnot, is I found that some of those tubs um, put it on their microscope and it was all dead and it was really serving the function. And if you're going to read the types of... Um, organisms that are in them, sometimes you'd find like some of the common bacillus, uh, that soil bacteria, and then yeah. there'd be two or three in there. And then um, I, you got to be careful about some of the products that are on the market because 
what I understand to be um, good, healthy biology, soil biology is uh, diversity in a big gamut. And then yeah. I think that you could very easily let the lion out in the zoo full of penguins and, and rabbits and stuff. And that's not necessarily going to um, serve the function of providing the right interactions with the plant. So I always, I think that looking at it from a shotgun approach where you're inoculating the site with all types of biology and and ideally some of it associates with the plant and works well. Yeah, um, it's like some it's a guys good approach. offer those dormant and then the, the native stuff that's acceptable for that area then hopefully will proliferate. Or maybe uh, you're in a site that you know is is low on phosphorus, and the biology identifies that some of the plants plants have a demand for this as per the exudate put out. So that certain biology will go to work more than others yeah. if it's present. I think that if you're buying a tub of mycorrhiza, uh, me I want to buy the tub with the most uh, the the most listed uh, species of, of mycorrhiza, both ecto, endo and ecto, and then there's going to be se uh, several strains. So one of the products that you mentioned earlier, one of those has like 11 of those strains. And I would, I, uh, that's, if I'm going to buy a product, that's the one I want to buy. Right. But our understanding, if you're putting things under a microscope, uh, where I, and again, I'm not a soil scientist. This, there's a lot of work out there that you can reference for this, but what I'm starting to understand is that, um, brews from, specific compost vermicompost is incredibly broad in its diversity and and what's associated with it in terms of proliferating it in a tea and an aerated compost tea you're able to propagate all types of of uh of of um of variety in there when it comes to strains of bacteria and fungi and i i think that that's a good approach but i also feel that Here's how I approach doing ecological restoration is that we try to wrap our heads around what a target site would be. So if I'm installing a riparian area, I would go to a very well-functioning riparian area, yeah, take nearby. a soil sample, identify who's there, and then that's the target. So nice. I think that if you're an arborist looking to um, plant a, a, an elm and wanted to, to want a packet of lunch – or associated with some biology, I would wrap my head around the target site. I go to where there's a lot of elms performing really well. Take a soil sample and wrap your head around what, what's the chemistry makeup of that? What's the structural makeup of that? Why is that plant performing well there? That's your target. So now if you're amending a poor site and you're wanting, uh, that should be the approach, should be the, the way that you're, that should be your, your, um, your path. So if you if you have a target site or target result in mind, um, now you wrap your head around, okay, well, how do I achieve that? I think soil samples are super important if you're looking to understand which relationships you want to encourage. Yeah, and we're talking soil samples to identify the microbiology, not like the I pH think, and the th structure and stuff. Well, are I we think or? you should understand all of this because all of those will give rise to understanding why certain biology is present or non-present. Okay. So if you, you know, under... I think that if you're doing a soil test, biology exudates and the biological component is important. And how to get, I think what's important is to understand why your target site is performing the way it does. Mm -hmm. So that includes texture, uh, porosity, viscosity of the soil, uh, is water running through it well, pH is super important to understand, chemistry, super important to understand what's available there. So actually, if you're going to be looking at the soil, I think it's important if you have a target site in mind and you're looking to emulate it and want to reach these results, again, we're probably deep in the weeds for your common arborist, but I mean, if you're, if you're strive for a hundred and then work backwards from there, um, what, what you're going to get to understanding is that in certain site conditions, the plant is uptaking certain things. So if you're going to take soil samples, I think it's crucial to also take tissue samples from the plant material in your reference site and that gives you an idea not only what's available in the soil but what's available to the plant because it's not always um, the plant isn't always going to have access to what it needs even if it's present in the soil there's going to be other biology being limiting factors being ph being limiting factors water movement through the soil holding capacity of movement in the soil there's going to be a lot of other things that you sh you're going to want to understand right. if you're looking to prescribe which product to use in terms of biological biostimulants. But those things you mentioned, like uh, the the water penetration or the structure of the soil and the the pH and things, could would you say that you know if you had a proper 
you know, abundant, healthy ecosystem building in the soil, those things are going to correct themselves? Yeah, I would say that that's the general understanding. Okay. Is uh, t typically um, a As good a functioning, ecology, like, he, but here's what I'm noticing, though, is that unless you're in a natural system where you're having interactions with all types of layers of plants and there's diversity, um, the full function of those interactions is typically limited. Right. So in, a, in an like urban setting, when yard, you're yeah. in a backyard, it's going to be... It's going to be typically limited. If you've got a uh, bluegrass as the dominant plant material in the backyard, that's going to be a very specific type of, of biology underground there that's associated with it, specifically the elm putting out exudates underneath this mass, this carpeted mass of roots that are very closely associated to a bacterial colony down there. Um, it might be difficult for your single ammo by himself. In the, I keep going on that. I'm just throwing yeah. darts out of board here, examples. But it might be difficult for that plant to form the exact relationships that it needs under there. Right. Um, th which is why I'm always pushing for um, diverse plantings. I, I yeah. never plant a tree. I never recommend you plant a tree. There should be communities. There should be we're, we're call, calling clusters. When we have a, a large ecological restoration area to populate, we won't take your money and then spread it out over there as a perfect um, deployment grid where you're just giving coverage. We're going to try and wrap our heads around installing that plant material in clusters that supports itself and uh, in terms can support um, the interaction that it needs with the soil. So the more plants of a certain species or of a certain group of species interacting with putting out exudates and interacting with the gas exchange that happens in the soil is probably going to lead probably going to give you the best the better outcome in terms of um, having resilience to the climatic pressures because it's important to understand that these relationships are just supporting processes as the trees adapt into its demand right to what's what the climate pressures are putting on the tree right I uh... I promote that 100%, diversity. I think there's things beyond our understanding or discovery yet. Um, I concur that, with this. That the consciousness of plants and the microbiology in our soil, you know, they're all one uh, and all contributing to each other. And if we can just mimic nature as best we can with good intentions, a lot of these things are just going to figure themselves out. You know, like, I concur. Like as opposed to like, Oh, let's test the pH with my pH kit. Oh, looks like it's too alkaline, so I'm just going to grab a pH an acidic, uh, you know, make my soil acidic with this jug of stuff and just pour it on there. It's like, well, we got to go a little bit deeper and find out why. And then if you understand that pH can be different right around the rhiz the rhizosphere versus the the soil nearby, and things aren't just that simple. But um, I love your idea, and I also promote this too, is like group plantings, you know, and understanding soil succession. So like grass and annual species are like on one end of the spectrum where they prefer more uh, like alkaline and bacterial associations and then as time goes on if that same land was left alone other perennials would start to grow deciduous forests and eventually the climax of coniferous forests which is going to be a lot more heavily fungal and acidic in the soil so if we can separate grass from trees as best we can, you know, or different types of grasses, but have that big mixture in there. If you're building uh, like resilience against insects and diseases, things are going to be a lot more, a lot healthier. You're going to have a greater biodiversity of ecological um, presence in the soil. I, I yeah. love all that. It's it's amazing. Um, and it just performs better. A good example is if you're driving around out here in the western provinces, and the you're looking at windrows. Um, I, I, you know, example I give is look at that single row of, of poplar, manitou maples, or whatever they chose back in the day, and then compare that to the performance of that one where he, you know, the, the he, the farmer, whoever installed it, um, did multiple layers and had some interaction between poplar and whatever he would have chosen, carrigan and whatnot. I, yeah. I recommend you use native plants, but I, what we're seeing is that at some point there was decisions to not do that, and I'm finding better performance by the plants overall when they're when they're um installed in such a way that they can interact with each other and with the site together 
Um, yeah. Found like the the wind roll where you had multiple layers was typically performing better, typically trapping more of the snow over the winter and and it, um, dropping more organic matter onto the site and slowly improving conditions for themselves as opposed to that poor bastard plant by itself out there <laughs> yeah. um, having to compete with the grass <laughs> and this is what we see as arborists yeah. in people's backyards. This is why I found it difficult to inform on best practice for how to keep your tree healthy because really the solution is rip all the shit out excuse my language and then go again right and i you know we i we never install straight lines when it comes to landscaping mm-hmm. and backyards just because they don't just don't perform as well that yeah. ornamental plant all by itself is just lacking some what we're finding to be necessaries I was just doing some planting actually the other day uh for the first time for, with atmos tree and um cool. We were doing an eco buffer, so it was on. It was on some farmland to kind of restore it, but it was like a greater density. So like the old school kind of density for like shelter belts or whatever it might be was, you know, a thousand per hectare. I can't remember the exact numbers because you know the guy in charge was was an expert on this and we was quizzing him on it. But uh, this was like you know more like five thousand, like five times the amount of density, and nothing was planted in rows. It was kind of plunked all over the place, and it was a mixture of like. Uh, black spruce and larch, and then we had Saskatoon. Awesome. Um, yeah, like everything, all all working together. And the whole point of it is that it's going to grow up, it's going to grow dense, and it's going to be able to self feed itself its own leaves and create its own mulch layers, like all that kind of stuff. So done in a more natural way, which is uh, mm-hmm. kind of a pain in the ass, I understand for a lot of the tree planters because it's a lot easier for them to walk in a straight line. But but these totally. people were also passionate about the trees and doing it properly in the right way. So they kind of like they didn't mind at the same time, you know, and they weren't paid per tree, which was great. It was paid for their time. I Things found when I was installing plant material, when I, I actually got really good at doing it in a natural way in people's backyards. Um, you look at my backyard, I'd like to invite you sometime. It's uh, very much designed to be natural setting. And then what I found is that that's pleasing to the eye and people really, really, really enjoy that more than that uh, real conventional regal planter in the, in the corner that you used to see a lot more of which was the you know the topiary bush and the shaped tree and people are i'm finding that there's a lot of desire to lay your eye on just natural on on things that look more natural and i think that if you wrap your head around how to provide that there's a big reception for it people want it they're happy for it whenever we install the the work that we do in urban settings we hear a lot of feedback i'm so glad this is here it's so soothing to the eye fantastic as opposed to staring at a row of poplars or whatnot yeah and it can be a lot natural aesthetic goes a long ways for your your psyche right it can be a lot less maintenance too so um, can if we can get back to like how do you start amending the soil in those crappy places like do you just top dress and and wait for things that microbes that work their way down or yeah that's one way um that that can be one way. It depends on the scale, obviously. Yeah. It depends on on uh, what's present and when it comes to amending soils. Typically, um, to have impact over a large area because we do things at scale. Yeah. Amending at the planting site is is one approach. So if you're installing a lot of plant material, if you amend at the planting site, you've pretty much amended a good portion of the entire site. And if you've chosen your species correctly and you space them well, and then you're having good functionality of the, the system you've installed, it uh, eventually should support itself. I I think that when it comes to amending, um, it's really hard to throw specific rules. There are general rules. Is mm. there you know organic matter in the soil? Understanding the soil conditions that the tree are looking to plant wants is it like targets. Tar- I I. I always suggest, recommend that you understand your targets and always use them as reference. So you're, you know, okay, I, I want to install elm and juniper. Well, okay, well, typically what soils do they perform well in? There's there's lots of documentation out there. That's easy to find out at least ranges for them, tolerance ranges, and then wrap your head around what you got, what you're working with. That should inform your amendment. So should I throw peat? Well, that depends. What's your site like? Should I should I use compost? That depends. What's available? You know, I think actually that depends is a golden rule in my business. Yeah. Uh, what should I do? That depends. Yeah. I think you need to you need to be able to understand what you're working with. Yeah. To um, 
to prescribe a good amendment. Now, there's going to be some basics. There's a great product out there, uh, Gaia 444. I, this is a, just a basic all-purpose fertilizer. It's organic. We, I like to deploy it a bunch. Um, there's other products like that that I like to deploy a bunch, especially if a site is um, is deemed to be devoid of fertility. If I don't think there's good chemistry in there to support plant growth, I'll try and add some. Um, there was, a, like I say, I get to a place now where I was trying to scale it, uh, scale applying amendments to like overly uh, silty soils that, you know, that um, the water drained through too quickly and it, it was very difficult to establish in plant material because it's high exposure, the the material, the, the media preheats, is really hostile to roots. So how the hell do I deal with this? Um, I met a fellow who developed a company where he palletizes soil amendments so it'd be like compost and humates and or things like organic matter like straw wool you know there they were diverting waste streams and pelletizing this amendment that i could broadcast and then once uh, as it watered it would expand it would slowly release and become available and work its way into the nooks and crannies of the soil and i was we were able to get some good results with that at scale and then there's often times where we had small sites where i'm going to be uh, installing a larger plant that's going to require more than what's there then we would amend at the site uh, if we're doing like industry work we would mix huge piles of soil amendment and top dress sites so that hopefully that richer top surface would leach into these sites i think you need to approach it per site and meet for me to give you specific uh, rule sets for amending yeah. Would would be actually counterproductive. Um, you might hit points of negative return if you try to adhere to specific amendment rules. I think what you want to do is, that, is understand your conditions and your uh, reference sites, your target sites. Is there any uh, work around broadcasting like a diversity of like say annual species or maybe even perennials of like a ground cover, like a fast establishing? You know, when you're going to go in, just set something to hold the ground and... Yeah, there's a lot of work done with that. I don't know that, uh, again, that's typically going to be site-specific, and I don't know of an awesome all-around solution. We deploy a lot of things, uh, you know, annual rye, while this slow establishing native seed comes in. There's challenges with that solution yeah. also. Um, it depends on your setting also, too. Like in permaculture, we would deploy a fast uh, establishing growing micro clover and they would be the first thing to colonize and you know add to the to the soil structure and then fix nitrogen for a season or two and then we would plant through it and replace it with something of more successional and where what we're doing we you know there's different grass mixes and different forbs that we like to install but I don't know that there's a great hit it all solutions typically going to be yeah. site specific and i think but your head's in the right place yeah yeah no i'm just thinking but i'm also thinking you know i pr imagine a lot of these jobs are people that have money and they want trees they want to go from you know the beginning of succession to the climax of succession we have to do our best with a certain budget as well even though we want to yeah. do it right and we don't have the luxury of five years of bringing in mulch letting it sit and then you know these cover crops of species to come in and then another cover crop and then putting in some shrub and then coming with the trees five years later. <laughs> but that said, though, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with this, Kurt. I think that if you're in the plant installing business, uh, structuring it around a long-term offering, around at least a three-year relationship, which is what we do at scale and it's sustainable, I think it might be a little harder to establish in the residential market. But I think you can do this, that uh, you enter into a in, you know, into an agreement with the client that you're going to support them through the establishment period. Typically, that's three to five years if you're okay. installing caliper plant material. And I think, actually, this is a pretty good business model to structure your relationship with the client around this establishment period. I think it makes sense for the client, for the tree, for you as a business person. There's ways to do uh, follow-ups. I, I totally recommend that I always recommend you don't plant a tree and walk away. I don't think that's beneficial for anybody. I don't think you're learning no. anything. I don't think your client's well served. I don't think the tree is well served. Personally, I think that if you're in the tree installation business, um, I think it makes sense to at least explore ways to maintain a relationship with, with that client 
And I, I typically what I've found is they're receptive to this because yeah. they want it to work. Oh, totally. I mean, they're doing it for a reason, I guess. Um, and that makes sense. I guess it would work because you're going to be monitoring, like you said, for generally for five years anyways. So why do all this work up front, get the money then, and then go back and just do these little quick monitor checks when you can spread it out over five years? It could be cheaper for them up front, actually. Just totally. To, do some establishment, come back, check, keep that relationship going. You're always in the back of their ear when they have other things yeah. coming up and they can see the progression and then of it. You so. can inform on things like, okay, this mulch is degrading, it needs to be topped up. You can inform on things like that sucker is actually not a sucker. It's, you know, you can inform on, on, on uh, the process. And I found a desire for this. I, I've noticed uh, like the market is actually really receptive to, to you sticking around. Like, keep in mind that that tree you're planting, this is a 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 year uh, process. Now, you just started a long, long, long process. Sticking around five years is, is what? It's, yeah. you know, honestly, uh, in terms of what you just did there, what you're accomplishing, if you're selling it from that perspective, me, I'm vested, man. My clients know I care about this tree and they want me to come around to check on, on you know, to at least be involved in the process of the establishment. Like I say, typically when that tree's off, FTG, when it's free to grow and it's well-established and it's drawing resources from the site, um, then I'm, I'm happy to walk away. Good luck. Um, I got other people. I don't want to see you no more. I fly at her. Yeah. But typically that's a process, man, and I, I, don't, I, I don't like walking away from an installation. I want to know that I consider all the factors and that I wrap my head around understanding what it was going to take to get to a successful outcome when it comes to – plant material that really in theory should outlive you man you shouldn't like i sorry if i'm like you shouldn't do it just for the money i understand we all have you know we got kids to feed and chippers to pay for but i think that if it comes from a wholesome place if you have the, the real desire to plant it that'll transcend into your your business for sure um, your interactions and your bottom line i think you'll see that you know you'll see that reflect in yeah. And how your business performs. Totally, man. That's what uh, this podcast is all about as well, is promoting conscious business. So Cheers. have a business, and there's nothing wrong with being a profitable business, but you can have a, a business that's you know meant to help the people that are all involved so everyone benefits. And so it gives back to the planet, uh, everything that you're using. You can decrease your waste. like All sorts of things you can do good and still I make concur. money. You don't have to just make money and be cutthroat at the expense of other people. That's not and what the client I do. is receptive to this. I like I haven't been in both the residential and the commercial sector. I think both of those sectors, the clientele is receptive to you um, backing up your, especially when we're talking about. Let's focus on tree planting, but they're they're receptive to you backing up that installation because it should outlive you, and you should have confidence in what you're doing. Mm. And oftentimes, that's going to require a follow up visit. I'd say I would say the majority of the time. Yeah. Okay, I got a question for you i hope it doesn't make you feel like you're putting you on the spot but inorganic versus organic fertilizer <laughs> that's a can good you, question can you exp I, i've gone down some rabbit holes with this and i've always been promoting organic and kind of shit on inorganic but you know what's the what um, can you explain your opinion of the difference and why one's better than the other or sure, not i'm or? happy to uh, first of all i would uh, address Deploying fertilizer. First of all, I would just address that. Okay. Um, a golden rule for me now and for us is uh, typically fertilizers to be deployed um, in light of a potential or as a result of a deficiency. Just deploying fertilizer to sites that are potentially fertile uh, can be counterproductive so i want to okay. i just want to start um so it's by a understanding this so it's very much like a supplement if you don't need to supplement iron what's good you could actually it could be detrimental to supplement certain things so fertilizer i think it's really important to understand your to wrap your head around the plant's needs what does it need to uptake um if you're out there with a nitrogen rich fertilizer you're probably benefiting the lawn a lot more and you're benefiting that that Colorado blue spruce you got in the front lawn. So that that's my first the first thing I would say in terms of preferences. Now, in terms of effectiveness, if you understand how the plant is interacting with with these these substances, these ions, and these available resources in the soil, um, one reason that I would 
recommend steering away from inorganic, from synthetic fertilizers, it's because if you're uninitiated and you don't come at this from a, I need to understand exactly the requirements and the, the lack thereof fertility in the soil, it's very easy to potentially burn. You can toxify the, the location by applying too much or applying the wrong thing. And so um, with organic fertilizers, less of this concern. So you, you can you have much less, if no concern, of toxifying or burning plants with organic, which is why if you're going to ask me, hey, what's your preference? Well, I, if you're going to be uninitiated as to exactly why you're providing which compound, you should probably stick to organic. Now, if you're looking to address a very specific deficiency or if you're applying this in a very targeted way and you understand what you're up to in terms of providing the site with a specific compound, excuse me, I got a leg cramp. <laughs> no, I almost had one earlier. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I, I, I wouldn't shit on, on – um, inorganic fertilizers i wouldn't shit on on synthetic fertilizers uh unless you weren't well versed in or understood what you were deploying and why so again like this analogy of nurses in a pandemic i mean it man you're you're people are relying on you to understand what to prescribe and why and you should come at this from a holistic understanding and just deploying products because you have access to them i i'd say it's, you know I wouldn't recommend that approach, and I'm from a different school. I think that if you're deploying fertilizer, you're doing it in a targeted way. You know why you're deploying it, what you want to provide the plant, and typically I think you shouldn't deploy it if you don't understand what's available. So first first of all, if you're not informing it by soil tests, you're, you have a bandana over your eyes and you're firing off a shotgun. Oh, this might work, but you don't know. Is it available? Is it not available? Is it already present? Is, are the conditions proper for the plant to uptake this stuff? I think fertilizer is a tricky question, and if it's your business to sell fertilizer, you're not stoked at talking to guys like me because I think it should be a very precisely deployed tool in the box amongst a lot of other tools. And fertilizer, typically, if you got the right amount of biology and the right biology and the right conditions, you shouldn't need fertilizer. The the go into nature, look at a forest, and wrap your tell me that it would benefit from you adding fertility. It doesn't, it wouldn't. The thing works on its own. The, these systems are able to access available resources in the soil. I think from my perspective, I've rarely seen a situation where adding fertilizer was the only route to a successful outcome. So yes, it's a tool and you should, you should understand how to deploy it, whether organic or inorganic, obviously for, you know, a, a, some of, some of the save the planet reasons and some other toxicity and water health reasons I you know try to recommend you go to the organic route as much as possible but that said um, I don't think you should deploy fertilizers unless you you have a it's like medicine from my perspective it's like unless you really understand the requirements of the plant that you're looking to fertilize and why and what's missing in the soil um, I think you should stick to organic if you're just looking for that buffer well it's there. I'll add it to make sure it's available. Um, be aware that certain synthetics could dam really irreversibly damage your installations or your trees or your sites or whatever, and that you should be fully aware of what you're up to. So, yeah, so those synthetics could be perhaps more concentrated or more uh, more one-dimensional, I guess, you know, just being NPK or, or you know, a, a specific list. Whereas some organic fertilizers, like maybe, could you consider scraping up the duff layer of some local trees and mixing that to make a bit of a tea and organic form of uh, fertilizer? Well, I, I wouldn't use the word fertilizer in that case. It's, okay. Uh, you, you'll be transferring very little of the chemical properties, the NPK and all that stuff. Um, but that, yes, I would consider that a very effective biostimulant because as mentioned earlier, I, I have an understanding that there will be relationships formed there uh, and which which will in turn allow the plant to access more things in the soil. Typically, typically um, when it comes to trees, typically um, there will be there will be new um, resources available on site uh, the lack of biology or the wrong type of biology or competition with other plants is typically contributing factor to to deficiencies 
I got to be careful. You got to be careful here when you're addressing this specific topic because um, th this needs to be targeted specifically deployed for specific reasons. That I don't. I don't recommend fertilizer as a broadcast solution for anything. Yeah. So like if you're out there pounding spikes, fertilizer spikes under all your trees, I recommend you you understand availability and requirements and then and wrap your head around the real end result of what you're doing because oftentimes um, it's easy to toxify sites and to it's it's easy to um, it can be easy to exceed thresholds of okay. tolerance. So for someone who's not going to do a soil test, you know, yeah. speaking back, yeah. and I know I'm pulling, I keep pulling you out of the tree planting uh, thing to get back That's to our good. arboriculture stuff, but you have so much knowledge that would transverse back over. But, you know, a lot of us go to people's houses and, you know, you got the tree in the front yard and it's either sitting in bare soil or grass or whatever it might be. Maybe they have it yeah. separated out, but we know just from being in that urban environment like we were talking about before, it's doesn't have that broad spectrum of biodiversity, whatever. We know it's lacking mm -hmm. something. It's not appearing healthy, but we're not going to go down the road of going hardcore yeah. taking tests. Um, what would you recommend in that case? Like I know we ha here have like organic fertilizers you can purchase yeah. in granular form. And of course it's like guano and kelp and whatever. And sure. as far as I understood, like the microbiology has to consume that. So you're essentially feeding that first. They have to consume it and then excrete waste, which is going to be a more complex um, yep. version of fertilizer or food for a tree, I guess you'd say, for lack of a better term at this point. Um, or you know, or do we just use compost? I like, guess compost could, a biostimulant so to you, or what do you or do you yeah, call it fertilizer? Yeah, compost and compost teas. I think compost teas are underutilized in the arborist business. Um, I, I've I found. I, you know, some of this can be anecdotal. A lot of times you wish that what you're doing is working and you're sometimes attributing it success to things that might not be a success. But I think compost tea is a really good way to get to a place where if things are going to work, um, that oftentimes is the missing piece. Uh, vermicompost teas, I'm a, a huge proponent of. So if you're not going to be taking, if you're going to be out there trying to apply like a broadcast solution to improve the condition for the tree in that yard, I, I, I think compost and compost trees are a great place to start. The, uh, the adding biology, I think you, you can't go around, especially in sterile settings like urban environments. This is, don't forget that that soil in the lawn was brought in as backfill typically. Very rarely was it originally native soil. And then there's there hasn't been uh, native plant material in there to foster. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> to foster a good biology. And it typically, if, if um, access to nutrients is an issue, improving the biological profile can oftentimes lead to good outcomes. So, in, and in terms of the org, these organic, you know, can I buy organic fertilizer? I've found broadcasting some of these powder slow release fertilizers to be effective. This is anecdotal again. Like, I'm not a soil scientist. I would. You know, I wouldn't yeah. say buy it, don't buy it. I got to be careful about what kind of advice I give when it comes to this sort of thing. But we've, I've seen, I've had success in deploying organic fertilizers um, at the drip line for trees that seemed like they were lacking in nutrients. But again, where I've had the best success is correlating soil and tissue tests. It's, it's not expensive. If you have a relationship with the local lab, it's easy to do. The one around here that we use is in, in uh, Red Deer. Oftentimes, um, there's available information on the internet for like agronomy when it comes to these specific plants. What, what, where, what range do they live in in terms of requirements? It's oftentimes can be really easy to identify like, oh, no calcium or, oh, the calcium's tied up for some reason, PA or whatever, you know, whatever the circumstance may be. I think you can get to a place where you're deploying the proper amendment, fertilizer, compost, whatever it is that you're going to deploy, I think I, me personally, I like to arrive at the prescription through an informed process. I like to, I like to really have a sense of no, why? how targeted can I be in applying. Okay. So uh, you can be general. I, I think you can do like compost teas in a general way, but I, I don't think that you're ever going to be nailing the solution with one type of product. Okay.
I like that. Thank you very much. One more question here. <laughs> Can you explain? Well, probably a couple, but what? Sure. Just explain quickly what compost tea is to people. You know, if they want to kind of learn a bit more about that, I know they can go online and probably research some stuff. But uh, compost yeah, I, tea I versus. Think if you want to learn a bit about compost tea, is you're you're um, googling or you're you know researching aerated compost teas, and typically what that is is a concoction of um, uh, there you'll suspend uh, typically in like a. Uh, um, the word eludes me now. Uh, you'll you'll suspend compost in like a what's that material called? Uh, you'll humus? suspend compost. Pardon me. Humus. Oh yeah, but you'll have your humus, your compost. So t yeah. uh, you know, if I'm referring to, to compost tea, typically um, the stuff we'll use is either the specific plant material that we compost or vermicompost or worm compost. And then you'll have that in a uh, cheesecloth. That's the word I was looking for. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you'll hang that in a cheesecloth type uh, thing in a um, in a container with water and added sugars. Yeah. What you're looking to do, and then you're aerating this, and what you're looking to do is you're propagating the the bacteria and fungi, the microorganisms that are associated with this compost, and you're you're proliferating their numbers, and now so they they feed on the sugar, and they're uh, in this aerated uh, environment so that they they explode in numbers, and now you apply this uh, exponential growth of these communities these different organisms onto your sites that's the basic idea of compost teas there's different formulations out there and different sources and different applications and application rates but the idea is that you're inoculating a site with it's it's the um the yogurt for your guts basically yeah. when it comes to your soil and it's it's like an inoculant versus like say buying compost from a department store been sitting there a lot of the microbes are probably dormant or dead Correct. and you're just you're just applying the humus like the leftover organic matter that they've consumed and wrapped yep. out right is that kind of the idea whereas compost yeah, tea, the you're, idea... you're trying to build up that biology first yeah you bet and you're it, it, it's actually growing exponentially so that when you you're you can take a tiny little bit of that and spray it all over the yard and now you've applied that biology and it can go to work and start interacting with the plant material I know the big the big thing with compost tea when it kind of first sort of got trendy there uh, that people were pushing was like foliar spraying, right? And that was a big deal. There's and benefits to that. And there was there was a debate as to whether that was did anything or if it was more just the fact that you're inoculating all the soil and everything all around it. You know, what, I mean, whatever. It's great intention either way. And yeah, agreed. I, if I had it, I'd probably I'd probably just spray my leaves anyways, just because I'm. You know what if it is, what if it does work? I've anecdotally observed benefits from doing this. I, I've uh, with all those microorganisms taking up leaf surface space uh, can, in theory, and and what I think is happening when I'm observing it, it can outcompete other pathogens very potentially. I think there's merit in the in the concept. Okay, yeah, it's not going to hurt um, as far as we know. Agreed, and it definitely will benefit the soil. Um, I. I did come across some papers relating to the benefits of foliar spray when it comes to um, biostimulants. I think there is a better understanding of this out there. Again, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a practitioner. What do you think about this idea? Sometimes I recommend to people, and I hope in your opinion it's okay, but as a quick fix, like people say that lives in the community here and then in behind them there's like a forested area or whatever, and we're talking about their trees and how to sort of amend some of the soil. And I say, you know, maybe you can go out in the forest, you know, grab a bucket and get some of that duff layer. So like the natural native microbiology that's there, put that into a bucket, maybe mix it with some water, make an extract, and then pour that all around the drip line of the tree. And then, you know, add some of your compost for some more food or, or your mulch over top as like the long-term food. But would that be a decent idea, you think, as opposed to Most just going? Absolutely. Your head's in the right place. Now, again, uh, my understanding is that some of these associates are specific. So the conifer duff might not necessarily be beneficial to a, like an aspen system or right. a, a deciduous system. But absolutely, your head is exactly in the right place. That's literally what we're doing. It's literally what I do is collect a duff, compost it, try to focus on these very specific microorganisms and redeploy them in association with the plants that that duff was associated with. I, I believe that there's mad benefits in doing this. Nice. Again, uh, anecdotal from my perspective. Right. So as hardcore as and scientific as this all may seem, it all <laughs> does come back to just mimicking nature what we see out there in the forest how just observe the environment how do things 
want to grow naturally. They want to grow together, <laughs> you know, all this kind of yeah. stuff. And if we can mimic those or the lack of those systems in our urban environment to try and replicate it, we're probably going to have some benefit. I concur. Cool, man. I concur. Are we at three? We are at almost three hours, Kurt. Wow. Two. Is it two? Two hours, but yeah, oh, we, yeah should, we are. Yeah, yeah. We should bet. probably wrap it up. Um, I'd love to have another one of these with you. I'd love yeah, to man. Dive can... into more depth into some of these topics. That'd be great because we kind of just uh, just kind of went for it today. Didn't have too much structure, <laughs> but uh, I definitely look I forward. That... Hey. Yeah, it would be great to uh, it'd be great to talk about how we can uh, how Atmos and Leaf Ninjas will potentially work together to get to a, a place where we can. Um, regeneratively uh, make up for some of the trees being displaced out there. I love what you're doing, man. I want to support it so bad. Yeah, thank you so much. I really do appreciate your support. I mean, uh, we got a lot of excited people that have joined. I think we have over 30 companies now. Amazing. I know it's busy season here, so like a lot of people are got their head, their, you know, they they're, they're got boots on the ground, they're working. Me too, so it's like <laughs> even getting around to podcasts and doing this stuff can be challenging, but I got the foundation set. So it's off and it's running and people can join at any time. So I hope people hear about Atmos tree through the podcast and, uh, they can learn something and align with some of these values and visions and see the importance that, uh, I think we both agree getting some trees back in the world and doing it properly is very important. And, you know, being part of the army out there collecting these $20 or $25 fees from clients who are spending thousands on removing their trees already is not a big deal. And it's all you got to do. Uh, add it to your quotes. I give you all the description, the line items. Simple, just copy and paste, put it in there, collect the money quarterly. We accept it. And uh, I'll give everybody Let's go. branding, free collaborations we'll throw trees online. In the ground that will work and that will support this and you can stand behind that yeah and i i can't wait like i just gotten planting out there like i said there last week and uh i got a little bit of information about that coming up right away and then with you guys here next week i think so it's gonna be so, awesome yeah. it's gone full circle now finally this idea we've created it we've got people Amazing. join we got the money and now we're physically putting trees in the ground so super excited i really appreciate your support Oh, it's our genuine pleasure. Let's go. Let's go, everybody. Get on board. <laughs> Let's get this thing done. Atmostree.org. And check right. out. Let's, where can people uh, learn more about you? I guess the website, hey? Leaf Ninjas? It's Leaf Ninjas. LeafNinjas.ca. That's Leaf Ninjas. Uh, yes, we're real ninjas. We can talk about that next time, too. <laughs> That's a puff of smoke, and there's nature suddenly. <laughs> it's, not, yeah, uh, it's a nature bomb. Leafninjas.ca. we got innovative solutions. We cater typically to uh, municipalities, industry, oil and gas, coal. We cater to developers and to uh, government entities. We also cater to uh, – we work a lot with closely with First Nations. Uh, we work also fairly closely with stewardship groups, watershed groups. We're cool. we're out there. If, if you you got a if, if you have questions and you want to understand a little bit more about renaturalizing, you have a, a you know a natch a renaturalizing issue and ecological restoration is uh, interesting to you. LeafNinjas.ca. There's all types of about us and contact in there. Nice. There's also a careers page. Plug plug. Plug uh, plug. We need good people. We need good passionate right. people right out here uh, helping out and being part of the team doing this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think uh, we got a lot of local listeners too. So. Uh, fantastic yeah we'll send them your way for sure do that thanks thanks for your time Kurt thanks for I, having me man thank you very much I'd love to come out to your place and see your backyard let's do it <laughs> okay we'll be in touch okay I'm so gonna, what do we do now Kurt I'm gonna hit stop and then uh, you're not gonna go anywhere say bye to everybody okay. bye everybody bye everybody cheers